If you were trapped in a parallel world and forced to play death games to save your girlfriend, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every death game in Die Now Part 2. This college student is going to regret having a girlfriend. Shia Chi here wakes up in a hospital room with no idea how he got here. The man is being hunted by a band of mercenaries after winning a series of death games, but doesn't have a clue who would want to kill him. That's when someone walks into the room and introduces himself as the leader of the Die Now security service. He apologizes for not being able to help the kid and explains the mercenaries that attacked him were hired by another player. The leader can't reveal who it is, but makes it clear it was someone the kid met in one of the death games, and they can't punish the guy for breaking any rules unless someone gets killed. It's company policy, but soon this kid will risk his life in eight new terrifying challenges to save his girlfriend. Later that day, his appointed bodyguard leads the college student to the entrance for the next challenge and wishes him good luck. Determined to win, the kid heads into a portal and gets sent in the middle of a forest with a bunch of other players. The game master warns that when an enemy becomes a friend, it is because of mutual benefits, but when a friend becomes an enemy, it's all about survival. Breaking down the rules, the voice explains 10 people will be teaming up against an 11th player who will act as the killer hunting down the group. They will have 9 days to find out the murderer's identity and win points if 2 or more people survive. But there's a catch. Anyone who reveals personal information, tries to find out someone else's role, or attacks the killer will be disqualified. To make things even harder, they must provide undeniable proof of who the killer is and with everything explained, the game begins. Confused, the players discuss the rules together and the college student suggests the killer might have a close range weapon. It'll give them a chance to catch a murderer somebody, and that's when this player speaks up. He reveals he's played this game before, and thinks the killer must be quite experienced if he's up against 10 people. Suddenly, the man disappears, and the game master announces that he's been disqualified for leaking personal information. It's a severe punishment, and the others are terrified of breaking the rules, but player number 8 reassures them, insisting they can win by working together. Opening the box on the ground, he discovers supplies for survival, but reveals there's nothing they can use to fight the killer. Suddenly, the game master announces he's exposed personal information, and the man vanishes from the forest. The others can't believe it, but this girl already has a clever plan. Okay, these death games just won't stop. The man has already managed to beat 8 challenges across 2 different games, and he still hasn't found his girlfriend. Now, he needs to spend 9 days in the forest trying to avoid getting murdered. If I'm being honest, with everything the man's been put through, the easiest solution here might be to find a new girlfriend that has safer hobbies, but if he was paying attention, there's already a quicker way to beat this game. The first thing to point out here is that this game wants you to think that it's only cooperative. If two players survive, everyone gets 5 points. If we figure out who the killer is, then everyone gets 9 points, and it would be easy to think that we are all working together against an 11th player who isn't here. The problem is that the game never said the killer wasn't among us. This is a clear sign that we shouldn't be too trusting of our teammates, and the first person who realizes this has a huge advantage. If the killer was one of these 10 players, they would be less careful in their behavior if they felt like everyone trusted them. And that's that's why if it were me, I would reinforce cooperative strategies among the group. That way, we can make the killer feel safe enough to take risks, giving us a better chance of observing their suspicious behavior. Thankfully, we still have our phones, and with this in mind, I would take notes on every discussion, keeping track of what each person says and why, because it will reveal patterns in their thinking. The killer will want to try isolating players from the group so they have opportunities to attack, and recording every interaction will make it very clear who is trying to manipulate others into drawing them away to be murdered. Now, according to the rules, we must also have undeniable proof of the killer's identity before making an accusation, but the best way to confirm this is to predict the killer's first target and follow them. Using deductive logic, this will likely be the most trusting player among the group because the killer would need to manipulate them into getting killed without anyone knowing. We should also consider that they'll want to take out the strongest or smartest player because they're the biggest threats and are most vulnerable early in the game when they have less information to work with. Keeping an eye on these primary targets is going to give us our best chance of identifying the killer, and if we see manipulative activity around any of these players, we can follow them and hopefully catch the murderer in the act to win the game. Investigating the disqualified player's case, player number 7 here makes it clear she's trying to test the limitations of the game and takes a sip of water. It's harmless, meaning they can use other people's items and insist they all distribute the supplies amongst themselves, but as the college student looks at his own case, he realizes there isn't enough water to last 9 days. The only way to survive would be to steal from the other players, and he warns his teammates to keep any personal information to themselves, but that's when player 
player number seven tells him they have to talk. Getting some privacy, the girl makes it clear she knows about the water situation and suggests they let the others get murdered. That way, they'll have more supplies and a better chance to identify the killer. But the student is shocked. It's too cold-blooded, and another player interrupts them, insisting they should discuss things as a group. He's also figured out there aren't enough supplies in the boxes, but knows where to get more and leads the group through the woods. Arriving at an area near a river, the older man brings over a pot full of spring water, and the others suggest camping here since he'll now have enough supplies to survive nine days. The older man takes a drink from his pot, insisting they need to try some of this water, and as his teammates go to fetch their cups, he suddenly collapses to the ground dead. Terrified, the group gathers around him as the game master announces they have 10 minutes to check his body before it's removed from the arena. Player number seven realizes the river water is poisonous, and the college student points out they should have expected this might happen. They were given low supplies to trick them into making this mistake, and it makes the others suspicious. He seems heartless to them, but this girl comes to his rescue, insisting he's only reminding them to use resources carefully. It's the only chance they have to win, and with the sun setting, the girl suggests they pair up to keep watch while the group sleeps. She decides to work with Chia Chi here, and they all split up to start setting up camp. The next morning, the college student notices these two players talking with each other, but when one of them leaves, player number seven approaches the nerdy guy, offering a glass of water. It's a nice gesture, but nobody in this game should be trusted. That night, the players are sleeping when the game master wakes them up and announces that someone's been murdered. Jumping out of their sleeping bags, they find player number six laying dead on the ground, and his partner informs them that he suddenly fell down, but that's when this girl notices something sticking out of his neck. It's a poisoned needle, and player nine insists that he didn't hear or see anything that could reveal who the killer is. And Analyzing the weapon, the college student tells them that since no one heard the dart being fired, physics dictates the murderer could only have shot the needle up to 10 meters away, and he suspects the killer will strike again very soon. Okay, this is escalating fast, and we already have our first murder of the game. The majority of players were asleep when the man died and didn't witness anything, but what's so frustrating is that we should have expected this to happen. Everyone knew it was the perfect time for the killer to strike, because there are only two people awake. Now someone is dead, and it's such an obvious outcome that the group really should have had a better plan from the beginning. If it were me, I would be making sure that we have more opportunities to catch the killer in the act, and since he might be a part of this group, it means we need to create secret plans that are only shared in smaller circles. It would have been much smarter to tell everyone there would be a two-man night watch, but privately enlist another player to keep watch with you while pretending to be asleep. This one simple strategy could have given us the information we needed to confirm this man's story, because right now, we have no evidence if he's telling the truth. You might think trusting someone to help is a risky strategy if they might be the killer, but this would actually be great news, because they'd realize we're secretly watching the camp, and they'd have no opportunity to kill someone. If none of the players die, the chances of that enlisted person being the killer rises by a lot, and it helps us narrow down potential suspects. Now, what's interesting is that as far as target selection goes, killing a watcher is a terrible idea, because the other guard will discover the body and alert the others, giving the killer very little time to run away. It would be far easier to have quietly murdered a player in their sleep and go back to bed, because nobody would realize someone had died until the next morning. It just doesn't make sense. But there's one thing we can learn from this situation. Sia Chi here pointed out that a projectile like this couldn't be shot accurately from any more than 10 meters. With two guards keeping watch, it's also very likely they would have heard rustling in the bush or seen movement in the forest if someone was close enough to fire the needle. With this in mind, I would actually suggest that we split up into two teams and camp in different parts of the forest the following night. If someone dies on the opposite team, we'll be able to narrow our suspects down to as few as three players and have people secretly monitor them until the killer is caught, losing the game. On the third day, the group makes their way through the forest when player number nine starts freaking out. He's terrified that the murderer could be anywhere and sits down, refusing to continue. Making the best of the situation, this girl tells him she's going to use the restroom, but as they're taking a break, this guy starts yelling into the woods, taunting the murderer to get him. The man is losing his cool and walks away, letting his teammates know that he's going to pee, but this will be his biggest mistake. Suddenly, they hear a scream, followed by an announcement that another player has died. Terrified, the survivors go running into the forest and find their teammates staring at the body of the paranoid man. A knife has been jammed into his neck, and the student asks what happened, but it's not good. The girl didn't witness the murder or see anyone nearby. That's when the student realizes the knife might have been thrown, and remembers the psychopath from the last game had this exact skill set. Looking around, he spots a golden card sticking out of a tree, and realizes the older man is here. He warns the others they need to keep moving, but this girl insists she'll split away from them, explaining the killer is more likely to hunt down targets from a larger group. The student argues it won't matter and points out the killer must have a way to track them down, but the girl doesn't care. She can't afford to lose and leaves her teammates, hoping this will give her a chance to survive. 
That night, the players discuss what the killer will do now, and the girls are worried. But the college student reassures them they're fine. Based on the number of victims, he suspects that the killer is limited to murder one person a day, but that doesn't mean they aren't being watched. The next morning, this girl gets out of bed and asks her friend to accompany her while she pees. They go off into the woods together, but this will be their biggest mistake. Somebody grabs one of the girls and drags her away before knocking out the other one. Back at the campsite, this player wakes up, looking around to see their teammates missing, and quickly wakes up the college student. She tells them they need to find the other players and rush off to look for them. Later in the woods, they discover a pair of glasses on the ground, and the guy notices a body in the distance. It's one of the missing girls, and he realizes she's dying from the poison, but something doesn't add up. The game master hasn't announced anyone's death, and there's only one possible explanation. The killer must have kidnapped the other girl so he can murder her tomorrow, and not exceed the number of victims he's allowed to kill each day. Meanwhile, player number 7 is taking a break, when a golden card comes flying out of nowhere and lodges itself into the tree. Suddenly, the 11th player reveals himself and threatens to kill her. The captured teammate begs the psychopath to help, but instead, he murders the girl instantly. It takes the real killer by surprise, and the man tells her to make sure the poisoned girl dies tonight. The team will win if she doesn't, and he walks away, leaving the survivor alone. Okay, this guy is an absolute savage. We've just discovered he's the 11th player and have confirmed that player number 7 here is the official killer. This means he's a double agent working against the team, but what's strange is that he's just increased his chances of losing the game. This makes him extremely unpredictable, and nobody knows his identity except for Chia Chi. Now, this presents an interesting problem, because according to the rules, we aren't allowed to share any personal information, and that means if he tries to protect the group by telling them what he knows about the 11th player, it might get him eliminated. This might risk their chances of winning, but there might be a loophole here to work around this problem. The rules only said that we can't reveal personal information, but there's a very blurred line between us revealing and someone else discovering information if we give them the opportunity. For example, at the beginning of the game, this player told everyone what he had inside of his case, and it got him eliminated because he volunteered the information. On the other hand, when the girl opened her case and checked if anything inside was poisoned, someone standing close enough would have easily been able to see what was in there. The reason this is important is because it's already been four days, but nobody has thought to check the person personal possessions of each player. So far, we've seen at least two different players die from weapons that we didn't even know existed, and that means it's extremely likely somebody here has items that could prove they are the killer. With this in mind, instead of having each person reveal what items they have, it's possible one of the team members could force everyone to be searched, which technically wouldn't be breaking the rules. If we find weapons on someone in the group, it would prove to the student that his arch nemesis isn't the suspect, and we could win the game regardless. Now, there's another very important detail here that we have to take advantage of, because she and she has to do that based on the number of people that have died so far, the pattern supports the idea that the killer has their own set of rules they must follow. From what we've seen, only one person has died every 24 hours, and if the theory is true, then this is a great way to force the killer to reveal themselves. This means as long as the group is together and looking at each other, then nobody will have an opportunity to murder someone. This will start to make the killer desperate, because if they don't kill someone soon, they're going to lose the game. With this in mind, I would insist that the remaining survivors sit in a circle, join hands, and literally wait out the clock. If we want watch for signs of desperation in any of the players, we'll find the killer and win the game. In another part of the forest, the college student figures out that the real killer was player number 7, and remembers that before he died, the girl had given a cup of water to the first victim. She made it look like he died from a poison needle, and must have ambushed the other player by tricking him into leaving the group. That means the girl faked her death and went to hunt down the others without anyone knowing. Suddenly, the game master announces someone has been murdered, and it's clear the situation is getting more dangerous, but the student already has a plan to beat the killer. Meanwhile, the girl runs away from the psychopath and returns to the player she poisoned. But as she's walking towards the girl, the survivors come out of hiding. The player pretends to be shocked, asking if they've seen the killer, but the college student reveals they know she's the murderer and can't kill anyone else today without breaking the rules. That's when the girl reveals that the psychopath murdered the dead teammate, and the older man walks into view, confirming she's telling the truth. Suddenly, their teammate dies from the poison, so player number one decides to get revenge and picks up a wooden stake. She tries to stab the murderer, but before she can harm the girl, the killer steals the weapon from her hands. The murderer is about to attack the player and manages to stop herself at the last minute, but then the psychopath pushes her forward, making her jam the stake into the girl's heart. The game master makes it clear that since the teammate's death was an accident, no one will be punished. With her secret exposed, the murderer offers to quit the game, knowing she'll go to the loser's world afterwards, but Chia Chi is surprised. He demands to know what she's talking about, and the player explains that there are two alternate worlds. One is for winners, but the losers go to the real world. Desperate to see if she's right, the college 
student reveals personal information, which disqualifies it from the game, and he returns back to the Die Now lobby, where his friend has been waiting this whole time. That makes nine challenges down, with seven more to go. Together, they go back to their university and checking his phone. The student is shocked when he sees that 17 days have passed since he arrived in the game. Later, the students discuss what happened, and figure out that he was only in the Die Now world for two weeks, but somehow it's been three weeks since they entered the first portal together. Confused, the friend reveals he was waiting in the lobby for only 10 minutes, and this makes the student realize this world might not be real. Nobody has noticed their disappearance, and it's just like what happened with his girlfriend, but since she hasn't been seen anywhere, she must still be trapped in a game. They need to act fast if they want to save her, and the friend suggests he join the game to help find her. Later that weekend, the boys are in their dorm room, but when the student opens the door, he's shocked to find a portal leading to the Die Now lobby. The receptionist welcomes them back and announces their membership cards are ready for use, so they can now enter the game whenever they want. Determined to save the girlfriend, the men wish each other luck and are teleported into their next challenge. Okay, this just got a lot more interesting. We've just discovered that we're actually in a parallel universe and can only return home by losing. Now, there's an extremely important caveat here, because if a player has a negative point balance on their card, instead of returning back to their world, they die. This means anyone who walks through a Die Now portal must win at least one game in order to survive. But what's interesting is that losing is still an option we can take without getting ourselves killed. The problem is that the girlfriend might still be stuck in a death game, and from everything we've seen so far, new players haven't been allowed to enter a game Game after it begins. If Xiaqi's girlfriend is stuck in a death game, they have zero reason to think that they'd be able to join in, save her from it, and pull her back out into the real world. These friends are operating on a completely unfounded fantasy, and it means they need to seriously reconsider how they want to rescue this girl. Now, the point system can become a huge advantage here because the student still has 15 and a half points he can use to protect him from dying. If I were in their situation, I would join a game and try to beat it so we can enter the winner's world, and once we're there, we can try spending our points to gain as much information as we can on where the girlfriend might be. Since everyone has been issued cards, it's very likely that the Die Now HC has records on each of their players, and there's a better chance they would be stored in either the winner's world or another alternate dimension. If anyone we know might have more information about an agency database, it's going to be our bodyguard here, because she's employed by the agency and has already admitted to knowing a lot of their secrets. If we can confirm where their records are, we might be able to convince HC executives to let us spend our death game points on gaining the information we're looking for and try making them an offer they can't refuse. At the end of the day, this agency must have a purpose for its existence, and since they're having everyone play death games, it likely has something to do with distribution of entertainment collection of data, or an elaborate recruitment process for the smartest and cold-blooded candidates they can find. If we discover what the HC wants most and appeal to it, then it gives us opportunities to make offers we otherwise wouldn't have considered and help us find a way to save this ridiculous girlfriend once and for all. The college student finds himself in a strange room where two other players are already waiting, but notices his friend isn't there. That's when the Game Master welcomes them to the Running Man Challenge, explaining that for this game, two teams will race each other to reach the end of the maze, and the first group there will win 20 points. Only one team member needs to make it, but there's a catch. On their wrists is a GPS that will blow the player up in 10 minutes unless they restart the timer. Machines have been placed throughout the maze to do this, but each one can only be used once per round. The game will restart if neither team reaches the goal, and with that, they're given 15 minutes to come up with a plan. Player 1 points out that the routes of the most time reset machines are both 6.4 kilometers long, but the one in the center is 4.5 kilometers. There are only two places to reset the timer, and it's clearly the most difficult route, but the girl volunteers to take that path, reassuring them she's an experienced long-distance runner. Their opponents might use this exact strategy, but the student explains they can put them at a disadvantage by using every machine they pass. That way, even if they lose, the other team can't reset their timers, and the game will be a draw. Agreeing to the plan, the clock starts counting down, and the players sprint through the halls before reaching the machines to reset their timer. But something's wrong. The student realizes he hasn't run into their opponents, and none of the reset machines have been used. It's strange, and he manages to reach the opposite end of the maze where the girl is already waiting, but finds out she didn't see anyone else in the track either. That's when the last teammate arrives, relieved that none of their opponents went his way, and the others are shocked. None of them have seen the enemy team, and then the game master suddenly announces they'll be re-energized. A bright light glows over them, and they stand up, feeling restored, but then they're told the game will officially begin. Meanwhile, the student's friend finds himself on a series of 
platform to the bunch of other players, and the Game Master announces that this will be a trial round for beginners. In this challenge, they will win 5 points if they survive the sky falling 18 times, and with that, the first round starts. It sounds strange, but then the players notice a series of platforms descending from above them, and they're going to crush the group. The players are terrified as the tiles freeze in midair, and the friend notices some of the platforms below are lighting up. These must be safe to stand on, and he warns the others to get on them if they want to survive. Everyone manages to step on one in time, but as they're beginning to understand the rules, the Game Master announces the second round will begin. They quickly rush for the new safe zones and avoid getting smashed to death, but in the third round, everything goes wrong. Two players get into a fight over a safe tile, and with time running out, the man pushes the other guy off moments before the sky comes crashing down, making him the first person to be eliminated. Okay, this is terrifying. If we aren't standing on the right tile when the sky is falling, we'll be crushed. And since it's a death game, it wouldn't be surprising if the amount of safe tiles reduces after each round. This is going to cause a huge problem, because just like musical chairs, everyone will be pushing each other out of the way to make sure they get there first. It's going to get violent as hell, but when you look at the competition in this room, one guy has the clear advantage. This man is built like a brick shit house, and it's going to be way too easy for him to strong arm the others, making him the only player left standing. These kinds of tactics are going to backfire on us hard, and and that's why if they were me, I would suggest strategies that can test the game's boundaries instead. For example, someone might not be able to make it to a safe tile in time, but we could suggest that they hang off of the edge of the platform to avoid getting crushed, and see if the game will allow it. Eventually, one of the players will be desperate enough to try it out, and this is a win-win. We'll either confirm a new technique to survive, or eliminate a player in the process, so it's mutually beneficial to every survivor in the room. A lot of them might have the same ideas but are too afraid to test them, and if all of us have more information about what we can and can't do, they can use it to keep themselves safe and find better strategies to win. As for these players, this looks like an easy game, but it's actually one of the hardest they've ever had to face. Each of these reset machines are 800 meters away, which would take an average human about three and a half minutes to reach. Once a team uses any machine to reset their timer, the opposing team can't use it at all. This could be a huge problem because if the others use only four machines in a row on their end, we won't be able to cover this 2.7 kilometer distance in 10 minutes. This is an extremely effective strategy to use, and that's exactly why Xia Chi here told everyone that take different paths, because the worst case scenario is that the other team is doing the same thing, resulting in a draw. Now what's strange is that the Game Master told them they would be competing against another team of three players who are running in the opposite direction, but after running through each of the corridors, they never saw anyone. Now it's possible they might have taken another path because there are connecting corridors in between, but the problem is that it would actually be a terrible strategy. These are clearly longer, they don't have machines along the way, and it means there's something about this game that is very suspicious. There's no reason for the Game Master to outright lied to us, but he's clearly not giving us all the information. In order to play the game with the best strategy, we need to know exactly what's going on, and that's why if it were me, I would use this first round only to test the boundaries of the game and the system. Furious, the others scold player 5 for getting somebody killed, and he points out they might be disqualified for breaking the rules, but before he can say more, the fourth round begins. They scramble for the safe spots, but one girl slips, and the platform crushes her leg. It's horrifying, and the man realizes that the time in between rounds is getting shorter. With that, the fifth round quickly starts again, and the players get into their new positions, but the girl begs the man to help. She's terrified of losing, but the guy ditches her at the last minute, leaving the player to her fate. She's the next person to be eliminated, and the others can only stare in shock. Later, the ninth round begins, and the platforms above the players' heads fall, but they notice that the safe zones aren't appearing as fast as they used to. When the floor finally lights up, the group quickly jumps onto a square, but one of the girls falls to the ground and gets crushed beneath the sky, leaving six players left. It's clear the further they get in this game, the harder the challenge becomes, and to make things worse, the tiles start separating from each other. The survivors struggle to maintain their balance, and this girl ends up tripping into the abyss. When the 13th round begins, the group scrambles to get to a safe spot, but there aren't enough safe spaces, so this girl jumps onto another player's tile before the sky comes crashing down. When it rises up, everyone realizes sharing spaces are allowed, but the friend knows this strategy is going to backfire. As soon as the next round starts, the group splits up, and the player in the jacket leads his partner to safety, but as the girl steps onto the platform, she accidentally pushes him off. She quickly jumps into a safe tile before the sky falls, and the player is horrified by her mistake. The platform above them is falling even faster now, and this man figures out that ever since round 10, the number of safe tiles have decreased, meaning there will only be a single space to stand by the end. The next round begins, and everyone rushes to avoid getting crushed, but they notice that the girl has survived by hanging onto the platform. It's a risky strategy 
strategy, and just as she's pulling herself up, the player is punished for breaking the rules. There are now only three people left in the game, and player number five will have to do everything he can to survive. When the 16th round begins, the student's friend notices a pattern, and at the last second, he jumps over to a tile. He manages to avoid the pillars and realizes he was right. Standing back to his feet, he confidently tells the others he's figured out which tiles will light up, revealing that the block behind player number six will be the final safe zone, but there's not enough space for two people. Reluctantly, the nerd insists his brother should stand there, but just as the bodybuilder passes by, the player shoves him off and takes the spot for himself. It's cold-blooded, but with only two people left, the friend already has a plan, and the final round begins. He jumps into the center just as the sky comes crashing down, but when it's retracted, he's the only one left standing. The man figured out that the shapes on the safe platforms can be combined from the previous rounds to predict where the next safe tiles will be, giving him the clue he needed to survive. He's won the game and transported out of the arena, making that 10 challenges down with six more to go. Okay, this was just silly. Earlier, these players realized it was safe to have two people standing on the same platform, and that's a really big deal. Before this moment, nobody was willing to take the risk because the game might punish them for cheating, but this one moment proves that the game would have allowed multiple winners. Instead, this guy pushed his friend off of the ledge, and it was completely unnecessary. Even if he thought the man was taking up too much space to share, we have plenty of evidence that this isn't true. First of all, it's pretty clear that these platforms are roughly one by one meter in size, and you can see here that there's still room on this beefcake tile. Instead of thinking of his size as a problem, we should be using it to our advantage because it means he's strong enough to easily carry another player. That's why if it were me, I would insist that if I get stranded in the next round, he lets me jump on his platform and catch my body weight. There's a chance none of us have to die as long as we support each other and keep using this strategy until the final round. Pushing this man off the ledge might seem like the logical thing to do, but then there's still one player left, and if he's just seen you backstab someone, there's no way he's going to let you share his platform. Now as for the friend here, I have to say that this is one of the worst cases of plot armor I've ever seen in my life. We've only seen the man act like a goofball, but when his life's on the line, suddenly he's jacked and smarter than Albert Einstein. Somehow, he realized that after round 10, every tile started showing different patterns in the light. If you look here, you can clearly see that these two tiles are completely different, and nobody else noticed this because they were too busy looking up. The hard part, however, is realizing these have to be combined with other tile patterns in order to tell you where the next safe tile is. With the rounds getting shorter, and the players getting more desperate, solving a puzzle like this is extremely difficult, especially considering it's this guy's first death game. If I were in this situation, I don't think it would be hard to notice that the lights on the tiles are different, but even if we don't know what they mean, we can still use them to our advantage. The smartest thing to do here is to tell the players that we figured out the pattern, but insist that the sky is about to fall so there isn't time to explain and that they have to trust us. Then, lie and say that a specific tile behind them will be safe so that they'll be distracted, and when the next tiles light up, I'll be able to react a lot earlier than they do. Meanwhile in the maze, the players start their second run and race down the corridors, stopping to refill their timers at each machine. Machine. But suddenly, the student hears an explosion in the distance. Realizing someone's timer must have run out, he continues through the maze, but that's when he discovers that one of the machines has already been used on his path and has to change directions. Finding another machine, he's about to refill his clock, but he suddenly runs out of time and explodes, sending him back to the starting line. He finds the girl sitting on the ground, but suddenly they hear another explosion and their last teammate walks into the room. All three of them have failed to reach their goal, and the game master announces that they've lost, meaning five points will be deducted from each of them. If the group continues to fail, they'll have nothing left and will die in the real world. Thinking quickly, the college student asks his teammate to recall why they all ran out of time and learns the others found that the reset machines had already been used, but no other players were sighted. The only thing that makes sense is if their opponents are somehow hiding themselves and his teammate suggests they spend the next round looking for the competition to make sure they actually exist. Coming up with a clever plan, the girl tells them they should use all the reset machines near their starting point and wait in the path to the right. This will block their opponents from the most direct routes and if any of them are coming on the right, they'll be able to catch them. With that decided, the team heads out to execute their plan, and the student stands watch over his spot, when suddenly he hears an explosion. It must be the girl, but that's when he hears another explosion and realizes both his teammates have run out of time. There's nothing he can do, and with 10 seconds left on his GPS, the student explodes. He reappears at the starting point where the others have been waiting, and the game master announces another round will begin. Frustrated, the girl complains that this challenge is impossible to beat, but the student calms her down and suggests thinking outside the box. 
It might be that the opponents are running in different locations, but the reset machines are digitally linked together. This will mean both teams are competing to take the reset machines without being in the same physical space. He tells them that the best thing they could do is run down Route A together using every machine, but skip A3 to rush towards A4 first. This should trick their opponents into changing their route, helping them win the game. It's the only idea they have left, and as the round starts, they race towards A4, but just as they arrive, the group sees a wire move on its own. The machine is being used by an invisible person, and the team explodes, sending them back to the beginning. Their plans have failed, and if they lose one more round, they'll die. Okay, these people are complete idiots. Every time they come up with a new plan, it fails, but standing around waiting for something to happen isn't going to help you win. Instead of stopping, the player should have rushed straight in to grab the cords and refill the watches before it's too late. It would have easily shaved off as much as five seconds from their time, which is all it took for this invisible player to beat them to the machine, resetting the game. What's even more embarrassing is that this is the only time it's happened. Earlier, when Chia Chi here was racing towards A5 on his own, he was nearly out of time and only two seconds away from exploding. Instead of Reaching for the cable, he paused and then grabbed the box like it was going to help him. It's completely idiotic, and in this game, there are only three things we can control, which is our path, our speed, and our time management. In competitive races with big stakes, people tend to win by seconds or milliseconds, and that means we should be doing everything we can to shave our time down. It's the one thing they aren't doing anything about, and that's why for the first three machines, I would only fill my timer up to five minutes, because it's still enough time to make it to the next refill station. If we're confident the next machine 800 meters away won't be used, there's no point standing around waiting to fill more time than you need. If you look at his watch time on A1 and A2, both legs took less than five minutes, and if they do this across four stations, it could save them 10 to 15 seconds. That's a big difference in a race, and it could have prevented them from exploding seconds away from reaching the machine. Now, the biggest problem is that the other team will be thinking of similar options, and we won't have enough energy or time to make it to A5 before them. We will need to be running at least three minutes faster to pull this off, so the best strategy is to think outside of the box and come up with something that nobody else would do to win. If you remember at the beginning of the game, the announcer explain that only one player needs to make it all the way through. That's why if they were me, I would insist that all three of us take Route C, but make the other players take off their watches and leave them attached to the refill machine. We know that C3 is going to be used by the time we get there, but if we leave the watch behind for the next round, then they're going to be the first to get refilled using the machine before anyone else can. We can also see here that the timer doesn't start until the cable is removed. As long as we can make our teammates sacrifice themselves, we can run the course alone and grab their refilled watches as we pass the machines using a full 10 minutes and making sure the other players won't get to them first. The college student is frustrated that he still hasn't figured out how the game works, but that's when he realizes something's wrong. The game reset immediately after they exploded instead of letting their opponents reach the end. This means the game doesn't care if the opponents win because they're not real. They're actually NPCs based on how the players performed in the test run, except the route they take is reversed. The slowest person on his team was heading down Route A while he was competing with a player from Route B, and it gives the student a clever idea. He asks the girl if she can run two and a half kilometers in 10 minutes, and she thinks it's possible, making the student confident they can win. As the final round starts, the team rushes to A2 and reset their timers, putting their plan into action. The student orders his teammate to go to A5 and sabotage the machine to stop the other team from using it. He then tells the girl to jump on his back, making sure she has the energy to sprint the last leg of their course, and carries her through the maze. They manage to make it to A5, finding their teammate laying on the floor, and realize he's ripped out the wires from the reset machine. It's guaranteed their opponents won't be able to use it, and with his task completed, the guy explodes running out of time. With his remaining strength, the college student tries to continue through the maze, but drops to the ground in exhaustion. The girl is the only one who can beat this challenge, and she acts quickly, plugging the wires back into the machine to reset her timer, determined to reach the end. She sprints towards the goal as fast as she can, and spots the others cheering her on from the end of the hallway. Exhausted, the girl forces herself across the finish line and leaps into her teammates' arms. The group has just won the game and earned 20 points each, making that 11 challenges down with 5 more to go. The college student is teleported to the simulated world of Die Now and reunites with his friends. Joining them at the table, he greets them when his best friend suddenly gets up, tapping him on the shoulder as he walks away. Confused, the student follows after him to talk and finds out that the guy is from the real world. He managed to beat his challenge and the two of them decide to hang out for the rest of the day, having fun at the amusement park. That night, the college student says goodbye to his parallel universe girlfriend when a player he saved from a previous game suddenly runs up, insisting they need to talk. 
Meeting the boys in private, she reveals that an experienced player has recently challenged the Die Now organization and claims to know its biggest secret. Curious, the student asks the girl if there's anyone who could tell them more about what challenging the organization means and how to do that. She has no idea who they could trust and has been a part of this game for long enough to give them an answer, but that's when his friend reminds him of the psychopath. As a longtime player, he might have the answers they're looking for, and soon the student will face five more challenges that defy the laws of physics. But what do you think? How would you be Die Now Part 2? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.